Back in episodes 9, 10, and 11, we took a look at how we could use a tool called DS Query to get useful information out of our Active Directory, and even extended that as we went into episodes 10 and 11 with very simple ways that we could use PowerShell to do some scripting in order to automate the retrieval of information. Now, we did at that time leave it as an exercise for you to explore different ways that you might be able to use PowerShell and DS Query, but we're going to expand on that topic today as we take a look at a very simple script that we've put together called Check Services. And the real purpose of this script is that it allows us to do some early detection for things like new malware and, of course, APT-style threats. Now, this is really going to be creating a baseline to it for us, and there are a great many things that we might choose to include in a baseline, of which this is just one. Let's just take a quick look at the script. As we get started with this too, I'd like to point out to you, of course, that this doesn't look anything like PowerShell. The reason is that it's not. This is actually a batch script. And you may be wondering, after we've spent some time in some of the episodes looking at PowerShell, why would we would, why we would go back to a seemingly ancient technology? And there's one very simple reason why. Let me explain by just walking you through a few pieces of the script, because then I can more easily explain why it is that I've chosen to use a batch script in this particular case. First of all, right up here, notice that we're creating a variable called remote host, and we're setting it equal to percent one, which represents the first command line argument. So the script check services takes the host name that you'd like to query as the first argument. And just as the scripts we ran with PowerShell, if we're running commands against remote machines, we are of course going to need to have some local administrative rights. So in this particular case, I'm using a domain admin account in order to run these queries. So now that we have that remote host, notice the next line creates another variable. This one is called options, and it sets up a whole bunch of options for things that it's going to do to that remote host. And it has here the slash node option with the remote host that we've specified. Well, what's this about? What actually happens? Well, in this script, we're making use of a tool called WMIC, which stands for the Windows Management Instrumentation Console. From this console, we can query any aspect of the WMI, or Windows Management Instrumentation, infrastructure. For instance, if I wanted to see what things are going to run at startup, I could simply ask for the list of startup utilities. Now, this report is reporting right now from my local machine, but I could just as easily specify a node, and this is not going to work at first, and actually leads to my explanation of why I'm using a batch script. But I'm going to tell it I'd like to talk to node GC1, and I'd like to get the list of startup items. And it gives you this response that there's an invalid global switch. Now, first of all, rest assured that if you specify the node name there, the machine name, this will work. So what's going on? Well, it turns out that Microsoft is a little bit sensitive about having dashes in machine names. The problem is that quite a large number of sites that I do work with actually use dashes in their machine names. And if you choose to do this, I personally have not been able to find a way to use the WMIC command line tool within PowerShell with a machine name with a dash. So I've chosen to revert to this much older and really simple scripting language in order to do this particular episode. How can I specify this then? by simply putting it inside of quotation marks. So essentially, well, not escaping it, but that's sort of what's happening. By putting it inside of the quotation marks, we're just fine. Now, unfortunately, this will not work in PowerShell. So even the quotes, the double quotes, the single quotes, it doesn't matter. I have not been able to find a way to get this to speak correctly using PowerShell without renaming the host. But anyway, so WMIC allows me to remotely query. Let's just come back to our script really fast and see what it does. What this script will do is first check to see whether or not, or, or get a list of all of the services that are configured. And notice it's looking for a particular setting here. With WMIC, as you're using it, so let me start up WMIC. We're going to ask for the same thing that our script is. Our script is asking for the service list. Well, if I just say service slash question mark, 
it will give me all of the different options that are available. For instance, using the WMIC command, it's actually possible to start and stop services as well. Well, I just like to list them, but if I get the context-sensitive help there, notice that there are even more limited lists of services. I could see them all, or maybe I'm interested in just the configuration information. And in fact, that is what I care about. Because if I asked for the full list, that's the default, it would also include things like the process ID which is not that useful for me, especially since we'll find that the process ID will change every single time the machine is rebooted. So if instead I ask for the process list config or the service list config, let me just scroll up to the top here. Notice that we now have a list. Oh, it's actually scrolled off the screen. We now have a list that shows us the name of the service, whether or not it's configured, how it's configured to start, auto, manual, and and of course, whether or not it's currently functioning. This is exactly what I'm looking for. It even includes the actual path name for the service that will be running. Once it gathers that information, the next thing that it's going to do is check to see whether or not there is already a file with the name of this host. Now I'll demonstrate this rather than walking through the actual script and explaining it because the script will work just as is if you simply copy and paste it. So if there is no baseline, it will create one. If there is a baseline already, it will check to see right here with this file compare whether or not there have been any changes detected. Let's just try the script out and see what actually happens. To initiate this script, I actually have a second script called go uh, at least I think it's called Go. Oh, it's on my desktop. And all this script does, it actually uses some of the DS query magic that we talked about back in those earlier episodes. It goes off into the domain root and finds all of the machines that are computers and gets the attribute name for those systems. Now, you may wonder, why couldn't we just do DS query computer? And we certainly could, but if we do DS query computer, remember that it will return to us the canonical or the, um, the fully distinguished name. And while it's possible to pipe that output through DS get computer and ask it for the, well, I don't think there is a name, but there is a SAM ID. Those are the computer names. We can see them, but all of them have dollar signs on the end. So to avoid that dollar sign and having to deal with it, I'm simply using a more complex query here that allows me to grab the attribute from within the DS query itself. And the name attribute will actually give me the raw computer name. That's exactly what I'd like. With that in place, I'm just going to type the go command and see what happens. So as you can see, it's, it echoed right up Enclave DC1 and then it prog progressed right to 2003 R2 server. Now, the amount of time that it took between Enclave DC and 2003 R2, that's about the typical amount of time that it takes to remotely query the services running on a system. So this actually does run kind of fast. What's it doing right now with the 2003 system? Well, as you can see, it notes that that server is currently down. And then, of course, it picked back up for the GC1, the vSphere server, and the Windows 7 system. So this has just queried all of the systems within this small test domain for me, and it's actually created files in this directory called baselines. Inside of that directory, you'll note that we have a baseline file for each of the computers that were actually up. The Enclave DC1, GC1, vSphere, and Windows 7. And if I were to take a look at any of the contents of these, for instance, the Enclave DC1, it simply has created a comma-separated file with all of that information. Well, how is this useful? Well, if we ran this command again, we wouldn't actually see any difference because none of our services have changed. But if we go into our service control panel and make a modification, so let's do that now, and we'll just do that on our Windows 7 host here. And that's fine. Let's see. We'd like to find our services control panel. Here it is. There we are, and under services, here are all of the services that are currently set up. And why don't we just change one of these? So for instance, we see that the ActiveX installer is currently set to be manual. 
So let's make a change here. I'm going to go to the properties and make this into an automatic delayed and apply it. And now I'm simply going to rerun my baseline script. It goes through all of the other machines. Now, of course, you can invoke that services script directly on the command line with a machine name so that you would not have to rerun the script just to do a test. But let's just test the whole functionality and make sure that everything is working as expected. For instance, there are no unexpected changes on the servers and then see what's happening on the Windows 7 machine. Now, again, the point of this is that by performing a baseline of this sort and knowing what services are going to start and not start becomes really critical for us as a as an auditor, certainly, but even more so as a system or security administrator, because any unauthorized change is a sign of really serious problems. And in this case, a sign of a change in your services is very serious. If you're looking at any sort of persistent malware, which is exactly where the anything that's being labeled as advanced persistent threat, see it's that persistent thing that really matters for us here, any kind of malware that's going to persist on your system, it's going to need to change something substantial so that it will automatically restart. The most common place that's done is in the services, either adding a service, modifying or replacing a service. So here, making that one change, we can see that, now, not that the output is super easy to read, but our baseline script can immediately find that there has been a change on this system. And if we now dig into that, maybe using a better file compare tool, like maybe one of the ones back from episodes 4 and 5 where we were looking at NDIF results, we can now identify exactly what's changed on that Windows 7 host. The beautiful thing, of course, is that this script now is querying all of the machines in our domain meaning that it scales very, very easily and allows us to track baselines for all of the systems within our domain. If a system is down, there's no problem, it just moves on, but otherwise it will find any differences. Of course, any differences that occur, we would just need to validate that it should have occurred. It was appropriate change. And at that point, if it was authorized, we could simply delete the existing baseline file and a new one will be regenerated when the script runs again. And of course, too, in this particular script, it's only going to print out that there was a difference, though you could have this send an email or page someone or whatever you'd like it to do as a result. We hope you've enjoyed this particular audit cast, and in the next one or two episodes, we're going to take a look at a few other techniques we can use for detecting malware, early threats, and advanced persistent threats within our domain.